Hey folks, today I've got your full in-depth review of new Garmin Edge 1040 and with that 14 new things to know. Now this video is based on plenty of real world riding, both epic rides as well as kind of more boring training rides. I'm going to tell you the good, the bad, and some of the ugly of the 1040 Plus. Now before we get to my 14 new things to know, a bit of a freebie, there's actually two different models. There's the base model and the solar model. The base model is $599 and the solar model is $749, a $150 difference. Now aside from the obvious solar edition of the solar model, it's also got 64 gigs of storage versus 32 gigs in the base model. And the 64 gigs means they preloaded all the maps for North America, EMEA, so that's Europe, Middle East, and Africa as well as Australia and New Zealand. Whereas the 32 gig version will only come with the maps preloaded for your particular region that you bought it in. Note that even if you don't buy the solar model, you can always download any maps you want for any region you want for free using Garmin Express, using the USB-C cable that we'll talk about in just a second between the Edge and your computer. So first up on the list is that new solar panel on the Edge 1040 Solar. Now you see there's actually two parts of the solar panel. There's the upper and lower portions that are most visible there. Those have a photovoltaic level of 100%. That means they're capturing effectively 100% of the sun's rays that hits it and turning it into energy for the battery. However, there's a second solar panel that covers the entire display itself, and that has a photovoltaic level of 15%. So meaning effectively only 15% of the goodness that hits it gets converted. Now there's some technical nuance to the numbers there, but that's kind of a simplification of it. Now of course, solar technology is not new to Garmin at all. They've had it on the Phoenix 6 for years, the Phoenix 7 earlier this year, and even the new 4955 just last week. But this is the first time we're seeing them put it into a bike computer. Now, while you're out riding, you've got this chart that shows the solar intensity levels during the ride, as well as the average intensity level with the time gained. And then post-ride, you'll see kind of a variant of that in the summary screens, as well as a summary after the fact on Garmin Connect Mobile that shows you the time gained during that ride. When Garmin talks about all their battery claims, which I've just put in the screen right now, they're using a solar intensity level of 75,000 lux. That's roughly equivalent to what I get here in the winter on a sunny day. I get about 70,000 lux, uh, versus if I'm in a warmer destination in the summer, I could be clearing 125,000 to 150,000 lux. So effectively double what they consider full intensity you could achieve meaning you can go well beyond their solar claims in sunnier weather. So for context on a couple quick rides, here's one I did in the south of France on a sort of hazy summer day. Uh, in that case, I gained 30 minutes over the course of two and a half hours versus the ride that I did the day before was four hours, but the first portion of it was in the rain. And then just a bit of sun towards the top of the mountain and back down again, also about a half an hour gain time. In the right conditions, Garmin says you can gain up to 40 minutes of time based on just an hour of riding. I haven't quite had those conditions yet, but again, I live in the Netherlands. It's known for being rainy and dark and dreary. Finally, you can also go ahead and place the unit in the sun, just being powered off or in sleep mode, and it'll gain battery life as well. So after a ride, if you're staying somewhere, you just put it out in a window, and it'll continue to charge the battery behind the scenes. Oh, hey, and just a quick note before we go on to the next one. If you're finding this video interesting and useful, if you can go ahead and whack that like button at the bottom there, it really does help with this video and the channel quite a bit. Next up, Garmin has added multi-band or dual frequency GPS to the Edge 1040. This is a technology they added earlier on this year to the Phoenix 7 and Epix and 4 and 955, and it's effectively considered the holy grail of GPS accuracy. And that certainly seems to be the case here as well. As Garmin has shown over the last six or so months, the accuracy level, especially in hard conditions, is super impressive with multi-band GPS. Of course, that does come with a hit to battery life, and you can turn that off if you want to. There's different modes. You can go multi-band for the highest accuracy or all the way down to base GPS for more normal accuracy, uh, but far greater battery life. If I look at a bunch of my tracks, no matter where they are, in the trees or in open conditions, the tracks are spot on, like scary spot on, in the exact right side of the road, the correct side of the road, if you will, uh, to where I'm riding every single time, easily beating the competitors, whether it be Hammerhead or Stages or Wahoo, uh, in terms of accuracy. I've got way more of these GPS tracks my full written review, which you can see down below there as well, in case you want to check it out. Next up is the addition of Power Guide. Power Guide is designed to take a course and then spit out kind of a race plan or a training plan for that course. It's different from a structured workout in that it's giving you targets that are specific to that particular course based on the gradient of that course. So once I've got my course, I load it in there, I specify the train type, whether that be on-road, off-road, gravel, etc. I put in my bike weight, my rider weight, I validate the FTP that it has is correct, and then from there I've got a little slider that can slide between the left side at easy or the right side at hard. And that changes my power levels over the course of a bunch of splits. Now these splits are aligned to the gradient changes on the course itself. 
So on this course here of Mont Ventoux, where it has a bunch of different gradient changes, I have something like 30 to 40 different splits for that course, or basically different power targets during that course. Then on your unit itself, you load up the power guide, and while you're riding, you'll see the power guide. At the top, you'll see the target numbers for that particular segment of the course, uh, and I'll show you the changes in the power guide below that. And it's even got a consolidated Climb Pro screen within that. It's like a super cool one-stop shop uh, when you're trying to race pace something, whether again be for training or racing. The other big difference between something like this and a structured workout or best bike split is that you can adjust this mid-ride. So if that ride just isn't happening, you can lessen the intensity level, and that way you're not being discouraged the entire time that it's not working out. Inversely, if you're feeling stronger, you can go ahead and perhaps bump it up a little bit. But of course, keep in mind that sometimes the goal of the power guide is to start you off easy to be able to finish strong. Of course, keep in mind power guide is fairly individualistic, meaning it's not really designed to be ridden in a group because you've got your own power targets. And if you're in the group, you have a draft, it means your power targets are lower. Still, it's great for individual efforts and pacing those more appropriately. Next up, we got a couple quick hardware changes. Number one, the biggest. Finally, USB-C. It has arrived on the Garmin Edge device after like a decade too long or something. No, not that quite long, but it's it's finally here now. Additionally, on the back, they've changed to a metal aluminum mount, which is pretty cool. They've also changed the location of the lanyard attachment, so it no longer goes through the battery door. So that way you don't have to, like the battery door hanging out open. If it flops open because of lanyard, it's all kind of tidied up now. Next, they've completely revamped the user interface. This is a complete change from the past. Uh, this includes general navigation within kind of the main homepage. You'll see there's now Connect IQ widgets on that homepage, that dashboard, if you will, that you can customize. You can add them from Connect IQ down the road here. They've also increased the clarity and readability in other pages by changing the fonts. They've added more definition to the Climbs and Climb Pro, just side by side here between the Edge 1030 and the Edge 1040. You can see just way more coloring showing the different gradient changes over the course of the climb. In the post ride, they've cleaned that up as well. There's sort of like a first summary section that kind of lists like the main accomplishments of that ride. And there's a more detailed summary section and after that gets super detailed. Like any user interface change, it'll probably take you a few rides to get used to it. Uh, that's true for me as well. The first ride, I wasn't really sold on it, but after the first week of riding with it, I was like, yep, this is way better and way cleaner. Next, Garmin's added the up ahead functionality from the Phoenix 7 and Firmware 955 into the Edge 1040. Up ahead means that you can take a course on Garmin Connect and add waypoints to it with custom icons. So this could be anything from a cafe stop to sprints to a finish banner, a town, whatever you want it to be, you can put it in there and then you can see the distance to those points via a dedicated up ahead page on your edge unit while you ride along. And then with that, it shows you an estimated time to each one of those points. The only problem I found though is that this estimated time appears to be some sort of like baseline time. It's not based on the power guide that you may have loaded or based on reality of the train. So you can see here that estimates 22 minutes to go nine kilometers up 9% grade of Mont Ventoux. That's not really realistic. It appears to be using just kind of like my flatland times as opposed to the actual climb that it already knows about in the course and the power guide. Hopefully we'll see Garmin change it down the road. This is the first time we've seen them add estimated times to up ahead. Next up is real time stamina. This is another feature coming from the Phoenix 7 series earlier this year, and it shows you basically your stamina level, your energy level during the ride itself. The idea behind this is to be able to figure out pacing as you go along in intensity levels. So if you look right here at the steady state riding, it shows me my kilometers in kind of time till empty. However, if I increase my intensity, it decreases my kilometers in time till empty, meaning it's looking at me and saying, based on what it knows about me, I have this many kilometers until I basically go kaput. Having used it for six or so months on different devices and now on the Edge 1040, I find it surprisingly accurate. Uh, most notably this past weekend on Mont Ventoux, just after I reached the summit, I reached kaput. My stamina basically hit 0%. And that was pretty true. But I was curious. I went back to Garmin and asked, what is the definition of 0% here? Does that mean I can't pedal a single pedal stroke? Or does that mean like I can't really race this anymore? And I didn't give them any context on this question. I just wanted to know what the definitions were. They came back and they basically said that once you reach 0%, that means you're no longer realistically racing that course. And here's the exact quote as well. And that was pretty true. After the descent, I was toast, I was fried. I still finished the last hour or so of the ride over rolling terrain, but there was nothing fast on that at all. I was just focused on getting to the pastries at the end of the ride. Again, the main goal of stamina is to figure out whether or not the pacing that you're doing is realistic. And thus far, all I've seen of the last six months shows that it's 
pretty good at predicting, at least me, and whether or not that pace is sustainable for the duration I need it to be. Note that you do not need to load any course at all for stamina, it just works by itself in any situation. Next there's the new cycling ability. This attempts to classify you based on your riding into different categories. You can see some of the categories on the screen right here. Initially it identified me as a flat specialist, and then over the last month or so it's upgraded me up into an endurance specialist based on my rides. Now one of the minor downsides here is that it does have to start fresh on the unit itself, so it's not actually pulling at any of your historical rides into the 1040, which is why initially given my train out here is totally a pancake, it identified me as a flat specialist, and then once I got to some hillier and longer rides, it upgraded me into the endurance specialist category. The reason why all this might be interesting is that when you load a course on the 1040, it shows the new course demands, and that attempts to go ahead and match your classification as a cyclist towards the course demands and shows whether or not you might excel at the course. Of course, that doesn't mean you can't complete the course or even do the course at all, it just simply tries to illustrate where the course might be more challenging for you or where you might do better on that particular course. Next up is a slate of features around navigation that they've added and tweaked. First up is the addition of a new search kind of option at the bottom there. And what's cool about that is you can go ahead and see your search history as well after the fact. So that's handy if you search for one thing and want to go back and actually navigate to something else that you found earlier. Next, they've totally revamped a bunch of the categories and gotten rid of like some of the automotive ones that weren't that useful and instead added things like bike shops. And I can even see like air pump and compressor locations. It's pretty cool. One minor thing to note before we move out of navigation is that while I mentioned earlier, you can download all the maps onto the 1040 from your computer. You can't do that on Wi-Fi, which seems like a bit of a miss. Wahoo has had that for years, as has Hammerhead and Stages and Sigma and basically everyone except for Garmin. In fact, Garmin even has it themselves on their wearables, on their Phoenix 7 and their Epics and their 955. So it seems kind of out of step for me that you have to plug it in versus all of these other devices. You can just do it simply via Wi-Fi. Still, at least the maps are free and they do include all the popularity routing data built into them. So it will route utilizing that data. And then that gets to the next one, which is far faster kind of route and location calculation times. And you can see these examples side by side here between the Edge 1040 and the Edge 1030, just trying to load up a long route. But that also segues into actually simply finding things, finding points of interest and stuff like that happens instantly. Versus in the past, when you search for something, you'd be waiting like longer than it would have took to ride there. Now it just shows instantly and you can go ahead and navigate to it. And that's also pretty much instant as well. Next up, they've added the Garmin Connect IQ App Store directly onto the unit itself. This means you can browse recommended apps and go install those without necessarily having pull out your phone. However, to give the same criticism I gave last week on the 400, 255, and the 955, which is that the way they've done this today is entirely useless. It's only recommending like the biggest of apps that I already have or already know about. I want to see new recommendations that kind of show off some of the power of the Connect IQ platform and small app developers. There are so many cool small app developers doing cool things, and this is a place that Garmin should be highlighting them, not highlighting giant apps that, again, no one really cares about. Next up, we got another quick one, which is a whole slew of changes around sensor support. Uh, the first thing you're going to notice is that when you finish a ride, it shows the sensors at the bottom there in the summary of your ride activity data. Not only that, it shows the battery level for their sensors. And then beyond that, they've added support for Shimano Steps, which is Shimano's e-bike platform, and that supports like 100 plus different e-bike models. Uh, so that's all now integrated into the Edge 1040 as well. So rounding out home here, we got a couple more things. First up, the touchscreen hasn't changed, best I know or best Garmin will tell me. Uh, and based on my testing out in the rain and with gloves, uh, it works perfectly fine. Again, I've done rainy rides as well, just this section here where I was just standing outside in dumping rain, and I had no problems navigating at all. And the same is true for gloves, no problem navigating the touchscreen either. Also, the screen resolution is the same as before, and it'll probably look better to you at first glance because of the fact that the fonts are bigger now, kind of the styling is better. But one thing to note is that if you look side by side between the 1030 and the 1040 solar, you'll note this 1040 solar is slightly darker because of that solar panel there. You'll notice over the first couple rides, and after that, you won't notice anymore. More. Finally, a couple things that you may or may not notice that are actually removed. Uh, the first one is a good one. They removed what used to be a dual Bluetooth pairing. For every previous Edge device until now, they had a legacy Bluetooth and a Bluetooth smart pairing. That meant that you had to get both of those correct, and usually one of those broke, which meant lots of like sync problems. Uh, those are gone now, it's just one single Bluetooth smart pairing. They've also removed on-device transfers, the ability for you to transfer from one device to another device. I'm kind of mixed on that. It's a bummer for it to be gone, but it never really worked before, so I guess it just clears up space to work on something else. Okay, so at this point, let's wrap things up a little bit and talk about some final recommendations. The first thing to note, though, is that my time with the Edge 1040 has not necessarily been super smooth. I've had
had a slew of bugs on this unit, mostly around like the unit just simply having amnesia. It forgets about what I did the day before every single day. So that means I get like a new PR. It's like Groundhog Day. I got a new PR for ascent, a new PR uh, for distance every single day. I've also had a slew of sync issues and things like that. Now the good news though is that Garmin sent me a new firmware update this morning and thus far based on my ride this afternoon, things seem to be like on the up and up and it's fixed virtually all the issues I identified to them over the weekend. Hopefully that's the case because if so, this is a pretty solid unit with a number of certainly worthy feature updates. Speaking of which is a bit of a bummer, none of these features will be coming to any of the existing Edge units. Uh, Garmin didn't clarify why, but unfortunately all the new features here stay on the Edge 1040, which doesn't really match Garmin's MO over the last year or two where they actually have been rolling up feature updates from new units to older units. It wouldn't surprise me though if it's because of the complete user interface revamp here that the older units aren't getting those older features because that would mean having to take the user interface into the older units as well which of course is a pretty big increase in development effort. And then finally you may be asking is a solar unit worth 150 bucks extra? And I'm kind of mixed on that. Yeah it's cool. It is fascinatingly fun to watch that solar time increase over the course of the ride. Like it's, it's super addicting. At the same time, you have to step back and realize this unit can get upwards of 100 hours in battery life. So you going out and gaining like 16 minutes over the course of a you know two to four hour ride on an average ride is pretty much laughable. That's like sticking it into the plug for four minutes. Like it just, it doesn't really matter in most cases. But again, in the right sunny hands, you're talking 40 minutes of battery gain per hour. And that of course is massive. Anyways, hopefully you found this video interesting or useful. If so, go ahead and like that like button at the bottom there or hit subscribe for plenty more sports technology goodness. With that, have a good one.